That's right. You heard the man. So can you listen to him? <laughs> Make sure you are subscribed to the Jacob Media YouTube channel. J-A-K-I-B Media. If you miss any of the conversations with John McMullen, there you go. You got the YouTube channel there. We post all of our segments each day from the night prior, so make sure you're locked in there. All right, just before 7.30, so let's bring John into the conversation now. Uh, Phillyvoice.com, SI.com, and follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen and listen to him on Extending the Play every Saturday at 10 a.m. right here on 1490. Johnny Mack, how you doing, my friend? Doing well. How are you, Ryan? Uh, I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. Um, how about Drexel, just real quick, before we get to football? Oh, that's exciting. How about that? What are, what are we talking about? A quarter century? How long has it been? Uh, of course, John, you hit the nail on the head. 25 years, 1996 is the last appearance. That's a long time. I mean, good for them. Obviously, you know, you look at the history of Philadelphia basketball, the Big Five, and then, you know, for a while there was really, really a Big Six. But, you know, Drexel's got to play the younger brother, so to speak. So it's always good when they have some success. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people, I think, nationally just maybe don't realize, at least the average basketball fan, the city of Philadelphia and especially, forget pro basketball, but college basketball. And you mentioned the Big Five and the Palestra and just uh, a lot of history. So it's nice to see uh, Drexel sneak into that tournament somehow alongside the uh, wounded Villanova Wildcats. But uh all right, let, let's let's get to some Eagles talk now, John. And obviously, the uh, the comments from head coach slash owner Jeffrey Lurie on Monday that's <laughs> <laughs> that's carrying the conversation. But uh, I, I guess we should get the something else tonight. I mean, what, what, what do you think, man? I, I, same song and dance. I don't know. I, we should probably call Jeffrey and ask him. Let's do that. You don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to get on his bad side, evidently. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. And, it, it, you know, Barrett Brooks kind of blew up the situation when <laughs> I was on the middle with him, uh, explaining way back in, you know, the late 90s, Jeffrey Lurie was, uh, was really making things difficult for Ray Rhodes. So it's not a new thing. It, it's just interesting that um, recently he seems to have a little bit more difficulty uh, Cloaking it, shall we say? Because um, evidently he's always been like this, uh, and that's been coming out over the past few days. Yeah, but he hasn't because he hasn't come out like this numerous times with unnecessary, you know, reports that are direct quotes from him. And I know this is a unique situation. We haven't had this situation previously, but still, there there could have been more examples of this and. I can't really point back to any. Can you? Well, that's what I say. He's been good at cloaking it in the past. I mean, you just, you know, heard a great story from Barrett, and that, as I said, that's that's a long time ago. Where, you know, he basically the story was Jimmy Johnson, who was an old tight end for the Eagles, not the not the Cowboys coach, but uh, was walking by Ray Rhodes. Uh, in the facility, and, 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 you know, Ray asked him, what's wrong? He just got cut, and he said, what do you mean, <laughs> what's wrong? You just cut me. And Ray Rhodes had no idea he was cut. None. Zero. The head coach had no idea he was cut by the owner of the team. So, you know, not, not a high-profile player. Not a lot of people are going to even remember him. But, I mean, that's weird. That is that is weird in any stage, um, and you know Barrett uh, said it, and and reporters who were around at the at the time confirmed it. Uh, I mean, it's been going on for a while, but it, you know where you're right, Ryan, is hasn't been as overt. So I think that part of it has has kind of kicked up a notch. It's much more overt about it. 
much more not interested in hiding it. And, and that part is a little bit interesting. And, you know, the, you know, people have made, and I've made them, and now other people jumping on the bandwagon have compared him to Jerry Jones, minus that, you know, sort of over-the-top personality and sort of want to be in front of the media and need. I mean, Jerry Jones had a, the first in-person press conference since the pandemic. I mean, he loves it. He loves the whole court. Um, so he's never going to be that guy. But as far as, you know, the interesting, the, the comparisons keep piling up from just the substance of the matter. And I think the latest one would be, you know, Doug Peterson compared to Jimmy Johnson. I mean, if you think about, and this is not Jimmy Johnson the tight end, Jimmy Johnson the coach, a lot of Jimmy Johnsons today. Um, if you go back to those Cowboys teams, bottom line is Jerry was upset that Jimmy Johnson got all the credit. You know, had a couple of gin and tonics and fired them. I, 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 absent the gin and tonics, you know, is that much different than what Jeffrey Lurie's kind of done with Doug Peterson? Uh, n- no, but I will say this, just, uh, if I'm, I'm trying to be fair to Lurie and I do not give two bleeps about that, but I mean, there are situations we can probably point to or, you know, we don't even know about from plenty of owners around the league, John, that have cut a player in their in their past, right? Without the coaches. Well, knowledge. yeah, I mean, generally, I, I mean, it, but that's normally for something sort of outside of football. Um, obviously, if somebody gets in trouble, for instance, you know, maybe domestic violence or something of that nature, you'll see an owner step in and say, well, we can't have this. It'll stay in our organization, things like that. Generally, generally, no, you don't see an owner stepping in um, from a from a standpoint of um, football decision making. Especially, you know, at the quarterback position, I'll, I'll even agree with you because that's an organizational decision, and and sometimes, yes, the owner will step in. Uh, so even the Carson Wentz, I can give a little bit of of deference to, but let, but Jimmy Johnson's a role player, and we'll go back to the tight end. We're flipping back and forth, so hopefully the listeners can keep up. Now we're talking about the tight end. He's a role player. Now why is an owner cutting a role player? That's bizarre. Yeah, no, th- that that is bizarre, and I. I'm assuming there's more to that story, but also, no, I mean, Barrett Brooks, the middle, you can listen to the middle every day right here on AM 1490, Monday to Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., as well as on phillyvoice.com streaming live. Um, Barrett is a co-host on the show. He's also obviously on NBC Sports Philly pre and post, uh, and you can find Barrett all over the Jacob (laughs) Media YouTube channel. I I mean, I'll say this, too, and... You know, the story goes on. We're talking about where, you know, you brought it up, John, where Barrett says, you know, I can remember when I was playing with the Eagles, Ray Rhodes was the coach. We went through that situation, but there's more to it. Um, They're implying that Jeffrey Lurie, you know, back in the day, air quotes, made personnel decisions and overall organizational decisions based off of what was being said on the radio. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that part of it was a little bit overblown. Um, you know, I, I was on the air with Barrett and kind of, you know, spawned the conversation because of what I said Mark Eckel had told me, and, and that's when Barrett told the story. So um, from what I gathered, it was the players thought that. They're, in other words, they, 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 you know, they would joke around and say, Jeffrey Lurie, and even Joe Banner, and Joe Banner definitely, definitely uh, listens to local radio. Um, But, you know, the players got a little bit uh, between them and and joked a little bit and said, you know, I think he makes decisions based on, you know, Ryan from the Northeast uh, or whoever's making a call, and obviously, uh, hopefully, hopefully. And I'm going to give Jeffrey Lurie the credit on this. I don't. I don't believe that for a second. I don't. I do know they get very upset at times by things that are written 
and things that are said on the radio uh, by reporters uh, and and people like that. They certainly so they they have a little bit of a rabbit ear problem. I will say that, but I'm not going to go down that road. I I don't think they make decisions um, based on sports talk radio. I, I'm I'm giving. You know, I've been very hard on Jeffrey Lurie, but I'm not going down that that road. You know, I, I will say this, uh, and I've brought this up to you in the past as well. Former head coach Doug Peterson, it was clear as day, and you know, I, I don't even have to say clear as day. He commented on, you know, in his pressers, John, like when the Eagles following a loss, you knew that Doug was dreading going up to that podium because the media was just going to hammer him with the same, you know, annoying questions, stirring the pot type of questions. And, you know, I just want to add to this real quick before you, you know, respond. Maybe he was annoyed because he would get pressure from his bosses. Like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious, and this is something we'll never know, like how how invested they are to keeping their finger on the pulse. And then obviously Lori coming out Monday saying no quarterback, no competition. I mean, that's that's all that's been talked about. So it's hard to ignore. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I You know, part of it, look, when you lose a game, yeah, I mean, sometimes you're just upset because you lost a game. Sometimes you're in a bad mood, and sometimes you got to go up there and you're a little bit surly. I, I think it would surprise people that uh, Doug had a very good relationship with the vast majority of us. Liked us, didn't, didn't, wasn't angry at us. I think a lot of times his frustration was having to go up there to speak for an organization that he didn't have power. And my best example I always give to that is, and Nick Sirianni better get used to this, um, was the White House when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. And you remember that whole kerfuffle. Uh, obviously, players, a lot of players didn't want to go uh, because of Donald Trump and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it became a, a whole political football. Um, and, you know, the Eagles' original plan was, um, you know, everybody was going to go and then too many people didn't want to go, and then it was down to really only a few people, and Doug was going to go, Nick Foles was going to go, uh, and, and Jeffrey Lurie was going to go, and, and, and some other members of the organization. Um, and then the White House kind of said, no, that's not good enough. And it, it was a mess. But, <laughs> you know, it had nothing to do with Doug Peterson, but he had to go out there and talk about it. And, you know, it should have been, um, at the very least, uh, Howie Roseman, but probably more Jeffrey Lurie uh, to explain the situation. But they don't do that, and they leave their coach to hang out to dry. So I think when you saw Doug upset, he had to do certain things that he didn't even necessarily want to do. And we used to have an off-the-record um, with, with Doug Peterson every week uh, before the pandemic. And, you know, he was very honest with us, very, very honest. Um, you know, and obviously you can't report that kind of stuff. And look, he, he did not have a bad relationship with Philadelphia media. He just didn't. Um, did he have a bad relationship with the owner at times? I think that's evident now in hindsight. Yeah. And, and, you know, I wasn't even implying that he had a bad relationship, but it was just clear and he was open about you know, just being aggravated, like, all right, yep, here we go again. And I saw you wrote this last week. And, you know, even in a good relationship, not many coaches uh, oftentimes go about it that way. So I found it a little bit interesting. Well, I will say, you know, a lot of the things, if you think about and we're, where we would push back, is uh, a lot of times Doug would get upset uh, when injury news got out there. Um, and, you know, Ian, Ian Rappaport or, or Adam Schefter would report it and he, and he blame you know, the local media. And it's like, it's not us, you know, who's leaking it to those, to NFL media, uh, NFL network people who work for the league, obviously, and the league pushes them in that direction. Um, and you've talked about, you know, Jeffrey Lurie's decree came out from Chris Mortensen, you know, do the math there. 
Um, he again, he was more upset about the pe- people leaking it and the people reporting it. When is the next time Jeffrey Lurie is going to speak? Because you have to ask him, John. Why? Why no QB competition? Why make it public? <laughs> um. It, it, it's going to be interesting. Typically, it would be at the league meetings, which, again, you know, obviously, um, probably not going to happen. Although, you know, everything is opening up. I just mentioned, uh, obviously, different parts in different states uh, of the country are, are opening up faster, and Texas would be one of the fastest, and they had an in. Uh, person interview, but I can't imagine uh, it would be anything more than virtual again this year, and that would enable him to probably get out of that. Um, so it, if it holds true, and and um, it's it's very similar to last off season, which even with the positive news, with the with the pandemic, it seems to be going down that road. Uh, I think the NFL is going to play it cautious and do most things virtually. Um, probably not until training camp. That's how long it's going to be. Of course. Um, so, <laughs> might not be able to hear from... In the end of training camp. Right. You know, typically. Well... I'm sure there's going to be plenty of new stories to uh, <laughs> to bother him about uh, at that point. All right, John, there's a lot of news uh, coming out today that could be related to the Philadelphia Eagles, and I'll just throw two names out at you. Both wide receivers, John Brown and Emmanuel Sanders, now single and ready to mingle potentially. Yeah, I, I mean, we've talked a lot, and – most of it will have to do with the Eagles uh, do at number six. Obviously, if you take a wide receiver uh, at number six overall, you're not going to be interested um, in uh, a free agent wide receiver. I mean, the Eagles have enough bodies. What they need is one really, really dominant body so everybody else could fit in a more comfortable role. And I think all of a sudden, if you do get, and I don't think Jamar Chase is going to be there, but I'll use him as as the sort of bookmark because he's the best receiver in the draft. If you get him, all of a sudden, you know, Jalen Rager could be fine as a second wide receiver. Uh, and then you hope um, some of the younger players uh, can develop into a solid third option. Uh, and if they don't, you still have Greg Ward, Travis Fulgham, uh, he's still a young receiver as well, so he could be in that same conversation. But in theory, you would want J.J. Ortega-Whiteside or even John Hightower or Quez Watkins, somebody like that, to step up. And it would be a lot easier if there's not a lot of pressure on him as a third receiver. Uh, he's not getting a lot of traffic. So remember, the Eagles, um, you know, the cap is officially set at 182.5. Um a little bit less than some people had hoped. Uh, could have been worse, uh, but that's where they are. And, um, you know, they they have some issues. Uh, so they can't be big spenders in free agency. So um, they're going to be more in the mold of looking for the bargains uh, in that second or third wave than splashy players. And, and those two are not stars, but they're both probably going to be out of the Eagles price range. And, and again, uh, it's tough. I've always thought the league, you know, should have free agency after the draft. I think it's backwards uh, because I think your, your preference as an organization is always to get younger uh, and to get more cost uh, effective. Uh, And if the draft was first and you knew what you had, then you could go into free agency in a more targeted fashion. But the way they do it is you're kind of blind. And I just think the Eagles are, are going to go after another receiver in the draft high. If it's not six, it might be 37, might be the second round. Um, so I, I don't think they're going to look at free agency and say, 
we're going to spend a lot of money there. I mean, they have to cut and cut and restructure and restructure just to get any money. Jalen Rager, we've talked about him a lot, and we've detailed wide receiver, but with the news of Brown and Emmanuel Sanders, it's uh, obviously worth discussing here uh, on this segment, John. Uh, Jalen Rager, you know, both of us, I think, at times have been a little critical, me, I'm sure, more than you, Um, but I think it's fair if we're looking to defend him to use the same reasons we use when defending anyone else, if we defend anyone else from last season, it, you know, the obvious things. The locker room was a mess internally. Injuries. I mean, I'm sure that whole environment and the lack of health on the field impacted his play, especially in his first year. So maybe some people were a little too hard on Jalen Rager, John? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, for the people who are writing them off, I think they're way too hard on Jalen Rager. I think he's a, a, a talented, talented kid. Unfortunately, by circumstance, he looks worse than, you know, because Justin Jefferson was there and um, he turned into a star. Uh, but people act like everybody does that. Uh, I mean, and, and just look at all the receivers. Remember, you know, there were receivers, Bruggs and Judy and, and, and C.D. Lamb, uh, even picked before um, Jalen Rager and Jefferson, uh, and Jefferson was better than them as well. So, I, I mean, I, I think there's this thought process that uh, because Jefferson was that good, Rager should have been that good. It doesn't work like I mean, that, that kid had an historic season for a rookie player in this league. Historic. He had a better season than Randy Moss, uh, statistically, if you take out the touchdowns. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of an unfair standard, and the only reason it is a standard is the obvious one. He was available uh, for the Eagles, and he got taken the very next pick. So, unfortunately, Jalen Rager had to deal with that. I don't think he handled it well, to be honest. He would get upset. And and by the way, I'll also defend him because people brought that up way too much. Uh, I, I don't under it, – it's not – you know, Justin Jefferson has nothing to do with Jalen Rager uh, as a player. Um, the Eagles wanted a, a different type skill set. Didn't work out early doesn't mean it can't work out late. And people should learn from Brandon Graham. Not everybody hits the ground running. And he's a talented kid. Uh, he's got some stuff to work on. He's not a great route runner. Uh, but things will slow down for him, and he'll continue to, to improve. And as I said, if you get a legitimate number one wide receiver, all of a sudden I think things will get a lot easier for him. Uh, to fit into that number two role, which is probably where he belongs, to be honest. Jalen Rager has as much to do with Jefferson as uh, DK Metcalf has to do with uh, our second white side, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, look, everybody does it. Every fan does it. Uh, and it's, 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 it, it's an exercise in futility. I mean, you can go into every draft unless you get the best player. I, I mean, you could do, you could play the what if game virtually anywhere up and down the draft. I mean, it's easy to do. Um, and again, you know, it can change quickly for years and years and years. It, it was, man, we screwed up by taking Brandon Graham. Earl Thomas was the, you know, should have been the pick and, Jason Pierre Paul should have been the pick. And those are both great players as well. But you end up, you know, a decade later, there's only one guy with his original team, it's Brandon Graham, and still playing at a high level. He becomes, you know, a Super Bowl hero, makes the biggest play in franchise history, uh, turns into a Pro Bowl player, on and on and on and on. Just because you're not a star in, in, as a rookie player doesn't mean you can't develop. And, you know, if you go back to, you know, if you go back to Tom Brady's draft, again, at 199, well, you know, every team in the league is kicking themselves. 
um, you know, 198 chances to take him. Uh, and nobody did uh, before uh, New England. And by the way, New England had no idea either. You don't draft a guy in the sixth round thinking he's going to be anything more than a, a training camp quarterback, to be honest. You know, the Eagles drafted Clayton Thorson in the fifth round. That's what you that's what you expect. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that go into it. And, you know, one of the players I, I covered early in my career was John Randall is in the Hall of Fame. I talk about him all the time because he wasn't drafted um, at all. And that's when the draft was 12 rounds. 12 rounds, Ryan. It's insanity. And he turned into probably one of the best two or three interior rushers in the history of football. So, I mean, there are other things that come into it. It's not, it's not easy, uh, and, and that's rare. I mean, it's not like you can point to a lot of guys like that. Um, and, and as we said, the analytics, the odds are the higher in the draft, the better opportunity you're going to have to get a, a, a good player. But uh, to play that game and say you should have taken Jefferson, you should have taken Metcalf, you should have taken blah, 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 you know, okay, well, anybody can do that. And and the second part is you don't factor in the situation. Like if Justin Jefferson came here and you think he's putting up the numbers he put up in Minnesota here in that offense last season, you're nuts. You're nuts. You know, that's a high volume offense wh- who has a great receiver, by the way, already there. Um and a quarterback who throws for 4,000 yards in his fleet every year, whether you want to criticize Kirk Cousins or not, look at the numbers. I mean, they throw the football, whether it's Diggs before he left, Thielen, um, Jefferson. It's not a coincidence. You know, you, you just can't put uh, somebody in one situation and say he's going to be that exact same thing in another situation. And, and that's what I think people don't understand. Good stuff from John McMullen. We do this every night at 7.30. Make sure you follow John at J.F. McMullen. Check out his written work at phillyvoice.com and Sports Illustrated at si.com. Last question here for you, John. All right, so they want to give Jalen Hurts – a full season with no controversy, no uh, you know debates for the quarterback spot. What about the tight end spot? And we've talked plenty about this, but Dallas Goddard is a free agent after next season. If you draft Kyle Pitts, can you really assess what you have in Dallas Goddard? Or do you assume the plan is you're going to move on from Dallas Goddard as well and stick with Pitts moving forward? Just talk about that dynamic here with just a few minutes left. Well, I don't think there's much of a dynamic there because Pitts is a glorified receiver, and he would be flexed out uh, more often than not. Uh, And Dallas is obviously more of a traditional tight end uh, who can play in line. He's also a good receiver. He's a good athlete and can do some other stuff. But, you know, people have uh, compared Pitts to Darren Waller from, from the Raiders, who in essence, you know, I remember when he was with the Ravens, he was a six-round pick of the Ravens, and they had joint practices here. Uh, and he was a wide receiver at Georgia Tech. He was this big kid, and he just lit up the Eagles secondary in practice. And I, you were like, who is that guy? Uh, and, and he was so big, and he had some uh, personal issues, uh, and then ultimately they shifted him to tight end, and he became a star uh, with the Raiders. Uh, but he, he he's always flexed out. Uh, I mean, he's always split out. So Pitts is more of that type of player, uh, and Dallas Goddard is more of, of a true wide back uh, who can play in line, uh, and is one of the better blocking tight ends in the NFL. So it, it, I, I don't think those two are redundant at all. The, the problem comes what we what we just talked about over the years with, you know, as good as Zach Ertz when he was playing well in Dallas early in his career were, 
do you really want to play that much 12 personnel? And then you get into the, the, the typecasting because even though he's listed as a tight end, is Kyle Pitts really a tight end? You know, some teams are going to view him as a receiver, but it, it's back and forth because while it, while he is a flex receiver, essentially, a, a slot receiver. Not going to play outside a ton. Um, you can't run like like the great receivers in this league, the outside receivers. So he's a, he's a very unique player. And we just you know talked to Daniel Jeremiah uh, earlier this week on a uh, pre-draft conference call. Uh, he loves him, thinks he's the second best player in the draft behind uh, Trevor Lawrence. So the best positional player, um, obviously he's a Philly kid. He's from Archbishop Wood. Um, so, I, I mean, he would be an interesting fit, and, and he would be, some people have called him a weapon, you know. Forget about positions, you know. That's another thing. Football's going the same way as basketball with positional as players. Now, people generally talk about that more on the defensive side of the football. In the back seven, positionless guys, um, but maybe it's coming in the offense as well. And maybe Pitts is is one of those types of players, and you got to think about him a little bit differently. All right, good stuff from Johnny Mack. We'll do it again tomorrow night, my friend. Thanks, John. Thanks, Ron. The, the, the middle. The middle. At that point, I told you, but I got a hangover, man. So what is this wild. hangover? Yeah, what's with this hangover? Right, I mean, what, what, what happened yesterday? Cheap vodka, bro. Cheap vodka, man. What? what, what? Well, I took yeah. pineapple vodka with the pineapples, and I infused it for like a That's week. Too or much two. pineapple. Pineapple it, it, is and terrible. It was, too, it was it was so sweet that you would just just keep on drinking, and I just kept on drinking it. Do you say you took pineapple vodka and then infused it into pineapples? Yes. I mean, there's there's sorority girls right now at Penn State that are <laughs> laughing at you, Barrett. He took pineapple vodka and infused <laughs> it into pineapples. Oh, I my. thought it would be a better taste, and it was a better taste. It was a great taste. It just went down too fast. Went down way too fast, oh, man. My. And next thing you know, man, next thing you know, three shades to the wind. See, watching Queen got... Latifah. Oh, my this God. Than... That's the line of the day. <laughs> the Middle with Aton Shander, Barrett Brooks, and Harry Mays. Weekdays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern.